Hey everybody, it's July 18th and you're here at the Chaos Weekly Community Call. So I hope everybody's doing really, really well today. Um, it's good to be back. My voice is coming back a little bit. I kind of lost it after being at Fossey for a week and just talking at people literally for like a week straight. Because I don't really talk to people here. When I live by myself, I just talk to you all. That's that's it. So like, an, you know, whenever I have Zooms, that's, that's the only interaction I get. So let me uh, share. Where did the share screen go? There it is. Oh, that was my dog. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. She's having an issue. My dogs are a mess today. My other dog's at the vet getting a procedure done, getting a tumor removed. She's hacking up a lung here. Okay. Anyway, we're professional. It's okay. So if you have not, <laughs> if you have not told us your favorite way to eat potatoes, um, this is the, the correct answer, actually. Thank you, Sophia. That's the right answer. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's from a movie. If you if you have not seen Lord of the Rings, then you you should. But you'll need like nine hours to just set aside of your life, because you you know, or more if you want to do the pre the Hobbit all that. But mostly just you know the Lord of the Rings is the best. I like mine baked with garlic, salt, and butter and parsley. Let's see, there's a chat over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll add it. We'll add it. It's been fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So we can hop right to it. Um, if anybody comes, if somebody can keep dropping the minutes in the chat, that'd be great. Um, the first item is just um, one to give a quick wrap up on Fosse and see uh, how it was for everybody. Here's a picture that we took. Um, sorry, Dawn, wherever you are. I know Dawn's off this month, but Dawn had her eyes closed. So we we're hoping that <laughs> there's another another better one floating around somewhere. We don't know for sure, but um, yeah, hopefully there is. Um, yeah. But it was great. We we saw so many new people that had not ever heard of chaos before. So that was amazing. Um, of course, we saw some old friends that had heard of chaos and it seemed to be on a lot of people's minds. Um, and then, of course, all of the all of the folks here, the chaotic that are in that picture were also giving talks and interacting. So I feel like chaos was kind of everywhere by the end. <laughs> I gave my um, Justin Flory, who's in that picture as well, and I gave our talk on Sunday morning, which was the last day of the conference. And um, I asked the question to, you know, a pretty full room. I asked the question who had heard of chaos before, and almost everyone had raised their hand by that point in the conference. So I feel like that was a success to kind of do some outreach, do some education, and bring some new folks in to the community. So that was really, really good. Um, Sophia, do you have anything to add to that? I think you're the only one on the call that was there. I mean, I think a lot of people are interested in metrics and I think just learning about our project and that there's a whole group of people that are actively thinking about this, talking about it, trying to create guides for others that are pursuing it. I think that, I don't know, it just like, it felt exciting to see how much interest there was and just like, even if you don't end up joining the project, knowing that the project exists and that we could be a reference or resource to you, I think it was just, it was really exciting to see that um, and just kind of also nice because our project is so applicable to the entire FOSS community, which I think is really fun, especially because not all projects can, can make that claim. And I think this kind of solidified that for me seeing chaos in this space versus an LF event where we were very much providing something that was valuable to a large number of people. So great yeah. job, everyone. <laughs> I would tend to agree. And um, I I feel like we'll probably do this conference again. This was the first year for FOSSE. So um, it was a smallish att attendee pool of about a little less than 300. Um, and we did have 27 folks sign up for the Lego Globe, so we had about 10% of the conference, I guess you could say that, um, that, that actually entered the raffle and filled out our form, told us about their metrics, so that was very, very cool. Congratulations to Sasha, Sasha Reed, wherever you are, um, on winning that big Lego Globe and, and getting that home. <laughs> so I'm glad I did not have to do that, because that was a, yeah, that was fun. 
Um, but yeah, it was really, I think it was really a success. Uh, we didn't really have any, any goals other than just doing some outreach and chatting with folks. So um, I think we, we met our non-existent goals, whatever those were, we did, um, we did have a good time and, and um, got a lot accomplished, I think, at that conference. Um, a few tweaks for next time. We are going to maybe get some smaller stickers printed. Um, people liked the size of our stickers, which were, I think, four, four inches by one. But, you know, laptop space is precious. And so uh, it's prime real estate. So um, we had been asked by a few people if we could have smaller ones. So we will also get some smaller ones printed as well. Well, we should have some bigger ones for people who are truly committed as well. <laughs> That's right. Somebody was telling me, I don't remember who it was, somebody from some um, community, and I don't want to, I don't remember who it was, so I don't want to say something wrong, but um, when they ordered their stickers, they came out bumper sticker size, they didn't realize, they were, so they had like giant ones, so I feel like we should also, you're right, Sean, we should have some bumper sticker chaos just like splattered everywhere, that'd be great, that'd be great, yeah. Um, we also did not really have anything besides our form for people to fill out. We didn't really have any convenient QR codes for them to just click and find specific information on our website. So I, mean, I think we're going to print off, if we don't print off stacks of flyers, we might just print off a few different things and just have them there at the table so people can, can find, um, cause other, the only thing we really had was the sign, which was awesome and perfect, perfect size, perfect everything. Um, but it just had the, the website listed. So um, we were pointing people to that, but it would be better to have some QR codes with like links straight to the metrics or straight to Augur or Grimoire Lab or wherever we want to send people. So we'll figure that out. Um, and then we, it would be nice to have a tablecloth with, with the Chaos logo. We had the GNOME um, folks were right here. And so theirs was really easy to see them. We just had gray. So you would see this sign, but maybe it didn't pop out at you enough. So um, maybe we'll get a big tablecloth too, just for next time. And then Justin said that when they do Fedora shows, they haven't actually like a monitor there with a slideshow showing like some of their folks, some of their events and activities. So that would be really cool if we could eventually do that. Um, not maybe for all things open, which is our next conference that we're going to have this table at, but uh, maybe in the future we could have, that could be a project that the design team could work on or whoever wants to work on. Um, just have it like looping while we're while we're sitting at the table and chatting with people i think that would be super cool but a little bit of logistics there and maybe some cost i don't know where we would get a monitor i don't know how that works so um yeah sean is saying in chat the tagline for his family is chaos on north lake yeah you got to get them to to get that extra s on there sean for sure <laughs> for yeah sure. i'm the only software person in the brood so they're not going to get it successful yeah. yeah maybe you could just handwrite it in like just wherever it's yeah it up, just i may just do that i may just take my t-shirt and add an s that's it that's it <laughs> um so does anybody have questions about bossy or kind of our experience there or have suggestions on what how we might make that better in the future i'm sorry i wasn't able to go um so it sounds like it was fantastic. It really was. It was extremely well run, I think, for, especially for a first year conference. Oh my gosh, like extremely well run, I thought. So yeah, I would really like to participate again if, if possible. Um, maybe some formal, more formal um, partnership with them next year with, with, between Chaos and, and those folks. So we'll see, but I thought it was great. Um, so the next thing on our list is just want to remind everybody we are having a badger orientation tomorrow at 12 noon US Central Chicago time. Um, there is a calendar, it should be on the calendar. If you would like an invite, I'm happy to send that to you, or you can just show up. You don't have to register or anything like that. Um, but if you are new to chaos, it's a great way you can contribute. Um, essentially, you're just double checking things that an, an event organizer is telling us. And we use those DEI metrics to um, for that application. So they'll have to tell us how they're attending to different metrics that we've developed in the DEI working group. And and again, all you I shouldn't say all you need to do because I mean you you mean you do have to you know know how GitHub works and um, be able to 
to get to that application. But essentially the essence of it is you just are verifying the information. So you do not have to be a DEI expert. You don't have to be a chaos expert. You can just, um, it's a great way to contribute for new folks. So show up at this orientation if you like. Um, it's an hour long. You can then decide whether or not you want to actually be an event badger. It's no obligation, no commitment whatsoever at all. Um, yeah, and it's a, it will take about maybe 15 to 30 minutes uh, of your time a month, if, if maybe maybe a little more, depending on how many um, applications we receive. But we try to really spread them out for folks so that not everybody's you know inundated and has a, a very large time commitment. Any questions on that? Okay, fair enough. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up was, I know a few weeks ago we had talked about our governance doc. I think it was down here. Yep. And I don't, I don't think, I don't know, Kevin, did we get this on the website? I know I haven't done anything with it. So I basically am just asking if I'm, if I'm holding up the show or if I need to do something. It's uh, it's not on the website yet. Uh, Vinod just pushed a uh, a pretty big uh, pull request that kind of that restructured the uh, the knowledge base. Right. Uh, so I have an action item to uh, to move that restructure to the website so that because they're not matching currently, uh, that action item is to happen before the next uh, before that next knowledge base meeting. So. So I haven't quite gotten to it yet, but it should be done within the week. Okay. Uh, at that point, uh, I'm not sure, is, is the governance doc currently in the community repo? Excellent question, I'm not sure. And I don't think Don or Vinod are here because they're both go out for a little bit. It was developed on Google Doc. So to my knowledge, it is not in a repo, but if you point me at where it should go in a repo, I'm happy to put it into one. I think, well, we can just check here really quick. So I guess sure. It should be the governance folder inside the community uh, repo. This is it, right? Yeah, metrics, context. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So okay, so you, mean, you can give me an action item to put that in a repo. Oh, it's already here, Sean. We're good. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, so the, the action, so the, so actually the, uh, the person holding that back is me, so I have the action item to uh, to uh, to link the uh, the website to that new structure. So uh, that should happen within the week. Okay. And then okay. it will be on the website. <laughs> if you need me to do something with that, if you get busy or whatever, just shout at me, and I will be happy to create a page and link it. So and then the uh, we do the the general knowledge item that we have for the. Uh, that the, the group that's that's meeting on so we meet on Wednesday every other Wednesday at 830. It's the uh, it's the community handbook working group currently. Uh, the action item that we have right now now that we have a, a base structure for the knowledge base is to is to start sorting through the documents that we have to see what's missing. Uh, what documents maybe need to be created. And, and which documents that we're using need to be edited to, to better reflect uh, chaos. So if anyone on the call is interested in doing some community handbook work, you're welcome to uh, join us on next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday, uh, for that meeting. And uh, maybe take a, take a moment to, to peek at the community handbook and, and come with feedback. Um, can, do you think we can post that? Because there is a um, a technical writer kind of subgroup under the Chaos Africa umbrella. Do you think we could post that in there as well, and maybe just um, see if the, any of those folks would be available to help with that? Sure. Awesome. I think it's uh, Chaos Africa technical writers. Nice I tech writers. It's tech, tech writers. Tech writers. Thank you, Ruth. Sure. Be honest. <laughs> um, I think it's been a little quiet in there, so I'm sure they would probably love to have something to work on. So that would okay. be great. How about if I I'll send them an invitation after I uh, after I make that change on the website? Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Uh -huh. 
Anything else with uh, governance stock or knowledge base stuff from anybody? Okie dokie. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up was something that I heard about at FOSSI called allcontributors.org. And I, I feel like maybe we have talked about this um, here, but I know I know we've been talking about trying Sean, you're breaking up. Contributors, but not all. Yeah. So um, we have talked in the past about how we recognize and surface and kind of keep track of these non-code contributions. Um, and this was, I, was something that I heard about at Fossey, and it's a bot that goes in GitHub, and it essentially lets you kind of just give credit where credit is due easily. So um, you would just say this, please add this person for design, and then it um, opens a pull request, and then it just kind of gets counted. So I, I do, I agree, Ruth, I think it is really cool. And I just wanted to, I mean, it's not perfect because people will still need to have a GitHub account. So if someone's contributing on something that doesn't even touch GitHub, they will still have to have an account. Um, and it will also, like if we're running overall numbers, I don't know if there's a way to pull those out or if it's just gonna get counted as a regular old, same old, same old code contributions. I'm not sure about that piece. But um, I, I was going to look into it a little more, but I wanted to kind of just show the community this and to see if it's something that they would you think we should add to our repositories or try out or what do you all think about it. Here's the link i'll drop it in chat. i've tried i've tried maintaining contributor documents in the past, and it is a it is a beast so i'd, I'd be in favor of trying this. Uh, however, uh, it looks like there's some, you can set it up to add the name and for a specific contribution. So we, we would probably have to talk about what those specific contributions are uh, that we would, uh, that we would want to recognize. And then maybe we could take a peek at our uh, contribution attribution metric and see how well that aligns uh, with this. Uh, which might include even adding uh, an organization, so a, a name, an organization, and contrib contribution type. I think that that's the way the contribution attribution metric is set up currently. Yeah. So just, just my thoughts, but I think it's worth exploring. Like maybe we could just try it in one of the repos, maybe in the community repo or something, just see how it works. Yeah, I've tried some things like tagging things for first time contributors. And so I think anything we can do that might encourage it, we should experiment with. I mean, we got nothing to lose, right? Exactly. And we do want to encourage yeah. new contributors, so. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's questions that I can't really make sense of in the documentation alone that I guess trying it out would answer. Like to Kevin's point, how we're creating a lit like a standard list of contribution types that we would be more specific about as well as I don't know what the data looks like like where is that going how are we going to pull that back into like I'm not really sure how it works yet <laughs> um, and I could try to peruse in the documentation but it might not be clear until we actually try it what it looks like to see if it's worth it for us so I think if you're up for a trial I don't see any any downside other than the maybe slight personal tax of adding that in now. Yeah, Ruth, go ahead. Yeah, I do agree with Kevin and Sophia because like it's really good that we should try, but there's also like some questions we can't answer. Like for example, something I just thought about is um for people that make contributions on GitHub that are not related to code, their data gets stored or their contribution gets stored and then or the other contributions, like say for example, design, they will also need an issue to back it up. We can just like call the bot to add a contribution without like a linking issue, like the picture shows there. So you might need us to start opening like issues, um, you know, for different tags, even though they are not being implemented on GitHub. So there's there'll still be some tweaks that we need to do on our own side or on our own processes to. But we should definitely try it. Um, something we have 
we had done in Chaos Africa some time back was to have like a document um, that kind of lists out like, uh, and that, that's very hard to maintain because you have to go update that document every time. I think Kevin mentioned that as well, right? So that, that document is even outdated of people that have made like non-code contributions. So yeah, but it seems like this bot is going to kind of automate that kind of document, just add them manually. Um, so yeah, we should try it out and then we'll also see ways to improve and also maybe give suggestions to the, the project itself. Yeah, I agree with everything Ruth said. And uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth, I think you're right. I think the community repo is probably the best place to try this out. Uh, so we've already kind of, we've already rolled out uh, a working group that's specifically uh, kind of building content in that space. So if we can find a, a volunteer to implement this, maybe we just roll this into the into that community handbook, uh, community knowledge base group to discuss and talk about. Uh, and I am I am interested what the presentation of these contributors would look like after everything is collected. Is it just a is it a markdown file? Is it uh, is there something else behind it? Uh, Oh, and Sophia has her hand up. I'm sorry. I'll yeah, no, talking. no, it's just kind of building on that because I think Ruth's comment is very salient to me around this just like change the way that we might work if we want to use this. And so just like, I guess, as we're paying attention to the trial, sort of also noting how we would have to adapt processes if we do want to use a tool like this, I think. Uh, oh, a conversation at Fossey, very relevant to this. Um, I was chatting with, wait, can you still hear me? My entire screen just stalled. Uh -oh. I still hear you. We can still Don't hear you. Yes, I hear you. You're frozen. Ah, okay. I froze it. Everything is black. I can't see anything. So I'm going to make my comment and hopefully you hear it. Um, I was chatting with Josh Burkus, uh, who works in the community, the Kubernetes community. And if you were in my presentation, I just kind of drilled in on that space. So we chatted a lot about how the Kubernetes community has also chosen to put more things on GitHub because of this kind of thing. Um, where like their events team and events management does all of their issues via GitHub um, as a way to just um, increase ability to track who's doing how much work in the spaces too versus just code code work um, in a way that like I think our our community has always used a number of different tools and platforms that kind of fit what we do and also not forcing everyone to use GitHub who's not familiar with it. Um, but I do also see the benefits in having more things in one system that has more ability to track, measure, and collect metrics about. Um, and so I just, I think that I'd be curious as we trial something like this, if it would essentially encourage more activities to come to GitHub as issues, even if they're not code issues, they could be event issues or website issues or what, I mean, that's already happening there, but uh, that's a bad example. Um, but like other things that aren't necessarily happening on GitHub right now. I'm going to turn my video off because I think that seems to be struggling. Yeah, that's super, super interesting. Um, I think it's a, I think as a separate issue, I think that's a really cool thing to do is to plan events more visibly on something like GitHub. So I think it's, it makes it easier to delegate tasks as well and to see who's doing what. Because um, I know when we do chaos con, it's very fluid and, um, you know, it's mostly just in discussions of, okay, who's doing what? And we have those, we have like a, you know, documentation, but um, we should, and <laughs> as Ruth says, we should open an issue for this discussion right here. I think that's perfect. So um, I will take that action item um, to do that. Because, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, I want to help with this event, but it's, you know, at least from from the chaos con, I'm not sure about the chaos con Africa side, but chaos con, the, the, um, the other chaos con, it's a little bit more fluid and we have a smaller team, so it's just um, more informal, but I kind of, I kind of like this idea of um, having that, those issues, just so that everybody sees what's going on. Um, open an issue to discuss this issue, I guess. 
<laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I think something that kind of uh, maybe limits or on the issue opening the issues part, at least for my end, is sometimes when I think about the wording to go and put in the issue, I'm like, oh no, I'm just going to do this like that, right? So if probably when we decide to go through that issue route, we can have like issue templates, like say for example, it's a program, it's a uh, an event it's um, a question you know have those templates so it helps people easily open up issues because I know that's something that I struggle on on my own end like anytime I want to open that issue and I think of okay I have to like structure the word and I'm like okay no I'm just going to do this so I would uh, uh, I would add that uh, those issue templates are documents that would land in the knowledge base. And we do have some templates, but if we are missing templates that we need, once again, I would encourage you to come to the meeting on Wednesday and, and, and let us know uh, what templates or what documents we're missing and may need to be created. And not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, right? A week from tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I think Grace, uh, referring to issue templates right those go would those do those go in the github org or do they go in the their repo level aren't they those are repo okay. level yeah but but the master copy would be kept in the uh in the knowledge base I, i'm sorry the, the main copy apologize for the wording yeah copy in uh okay okay So we kind of have two separate things going on here. Um, we have this all contributors, and then we have uh, kind of this this issue of um, needing get um, more. I'm curious to know what people think about using using GitHub more, especially since we do have so many folks that are so new to open source and maybe not familiar with GitHub, like, is that going to be a barrier or is that something that is a good on ramp for them to learn GitHub? Like, how do you all feel about that? Go ahead, Ruth. Yeah, I think, um, yes, we should do that because like, like you said, like some people getting new to open source, it will help them learn just that while we're trying to, or while we use GitHub, we should put in pointers like, okay, for people that do not know how to use GitHub. And I think this falls back on that, um, all the courses that we want to do, the Chaos 101s and all, um, kind of those pointers on how to navigate GitHub. I recently did an article and there was a comment um, from somebody that read the article that the it the the article, the article had like uh, graphics of how to navigate through GitHub to find um you know uh, open source project and then the comments was that that article helped them navigate github better because they felt like it wasn't beginner friendly to them so kind of putting pointers out there and then i do agree with anita's comments on uh Gita and github workshops i used to run that early on um when i say open source and it was really helpful for a lot of people getting to learn open source Uh, so I, Go ahead, Kevin. Oh, so I'm, I think I'm a little uh, agnostic on doing more things on GitHub. Uh, it, it could go either way. For, I'd, I'd be okay either way. Uh, so the, the comment that I would make is that, uh, so we, we used to be a lot more GitHub heavy than we are now. Uh, we kind of moved, we moved towards Google Docs for a lot of the work that we do because they're collaborative in real time, whereas GitHub is kind of a, the, the collaboration can be a little delayed, right? So it's collaboration over a longer period of time, whereas GitHub docs are kind of collaboration in real time. Uh, so I think that was kind of our, our thinking in, uh, in transitioning to that. So we've actually, we've moved from being really GitHub heavy uh, to kind of doing work in real time in GitHub Docs and then moving things into GitHub afterwards. Uh, so that's our current process. If uh, if we were to uh, 
start doing more things in GitHub, that probably involves uh, reducing the amount of work that we're doing in Google Docs, which once again, I'm, I could go either way on it. Uh, I do agree that the Google Docs do have some uh, opaqueness to them. They're not as open as GitHub is. Uh, but so that's just uh, my comment there. It's, this is if, this is probably something we would uh, we would need to discuss over over a few meetings. Ruth, do you still have your hand up, or do you have something new? Okay. <laughs> we can't hear you if you're talking, so I don't know. Maybe you stepped away for a minute. That's totally fine. Um, yeah, I, I agree, Kevin. I think um, we could certainly talk about how we do our metrics. Maybe it's time to change that up. I don't think they have to be... Um, I think we could do things also separately. So adding an, is adding an issue to do an event does not mean we have to take everything off Google Docs. I think we could, you know... Um, keep those things separate if we wanted to. They don't, one necessarily doesn't have to be tied to the other, but absolutely uh, think we could maybe talk about um, how we integrate uh, Google or integrate GitHub into metric development. And we do, uh, in, those, in those Google Docs, we do always collect contributor names when we do that. It's just, uh, we don't, we, we don't necessarily take that next step of, of moving that, uh, that name that we collect to a, uh, a more open space. Right. Yeah. So if we had so. something like that, all, all contributor bot, we could then easily just be like, add these people as metric developers or whatever we decide that contribution is called. Yeah. Cause the, the, each metric will have an issue, right. That, kind of is the prompt to add it to the website, right? Still, we do that. So we still have like a, a stream or an issue that we can keep that. Um, okay, what else on this, anything? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, that's the end of our agenda. Who has other stuff to talk about? I will say just as an aside, um, in uh, my talk with Justin, we we're talking about onboarding and some of the things that we're trying in our communities. And so people seem to really dig the, the idea that we would have a um, a course and like a learning management system that was very clear and very sequential and um, easy and something that people can do right away. You know, when they come to the community and they're excited and they want to do stuff, it's something for them to do and to work through. And then at the end of it, then they're um, a little bit more confident in their contributions to to chaos. And I also um, really want to just stress the point that it's it is going to be a community effort, that whole learning course, I think, um, because I really want to make sure we're listening to our newcomers when we're developing this because you're only a newcomer once right so it's hard for me, <laughs> I mean I can try to empathize with the newcomers but i'm not one so it's it's really important that we can include our newcomers and it also gives them some place to contribute. And, and the fact that they don't know anything about chaos is actually a, a good thing and a benefit to us so. Um, if you're listening to this call if you're on this call and you want to get involved in in this project as we're building this out. You can reach out to me or Ruth. Um, I, I guess Ruth, maybe we should start uh, formalizing this somewhere. Because um, I know we have a doc where we've been just kind of dropping ideas, but do you think we yeah. should? How do you think? Been look, go ahead. Matt's been, think, Matt's been look, Matt's, go, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to ask, even ask a question. Um, we, we, had, we have a user group that is focused on newcomers. I think that was in the. Um, governance doc rights so we can maybe either have the conversation in the newcomers group or another slack channel
because I know, um, I think Kevin, somebody, Sean, maybe you were going to say, yeah, Matt's been looking at platforms. And I know you all talked about that last week when I was not here. Um, so I feel like like this is a piece, there's a piece that's, you know, ideas of what the content will look like. And so I, I just want to bring the pieces together in one central place. Yeah, we discussed platforms last week and the, the challenge is that none of them are uncomplicated. And so Matt's doing a little bit of work to figure them out, but we're we're still in that evaluation phase of where to actually put it so that we don't create this complex thing that we have to maintain. Yeah, and um, funny enough, I was sitting next to the Aperio folks at FOSSI and they want, that's what they do, right? They have open source learning management systems. So um, that was not on our original list. Sakai is the one that they offer. So um, I, I, th I thought I would bring that up as well. They were super cool and I had a really good conversation with them as well. Um, from Aperio. Okay, and I see someone has added this with our last nine minutes. So who wants to bring this up? It's me and it's random, but I, we haven't really had a conversation like this. So it's more like I'm just curious to see how this group reacts and whether or not it's something that we want to take on uh, metrics related, but I, I've been working on a project and about halfway through my analysis work, I discovered that what I was seeing in the data was more a reflection of the GitHub workflow versus a reflection of actual data change or community composition um, in a way that I think as folks who collect and review metrics constantly, there's always this like sometimes a dearth of knowledge between the full system architecture community process and structure that changes fundamentally what the metrics look like and how we interpret them. Um, and it's just something that we all deal with in our work. And I'm just curious, um, I don't, we haven't really been discussing that in our metrics, but there are some metrics that would be more subject to something like this. Um, I, can, I can give the explicit example if that helps folks make this more concrete for them, but yeah, I'm just kind of, yeah, okay. Um, I've been working on a project to, try and distinguish work done in work context versus non-work context um, across our employee and contributor base inside the company um, and looking at various ways to group sets of repositories acted on by employees that look more work-like versus personal-like um, and the most obvious thing to do immediately was to isolate out things in personal repositories. Um, but the problem with that approach is that the, a lot of the work happening in personal repositories are actually forks from other repos as part of the pull request workflow. So it's the more like there was so much noise in there from that alone that it was difficult. Like I had to just kind of remove it all from it. But you have to actively manually remove it because of the way that the events, well, I'm working with data from the event stream, that's also part of the problem. But um, it's just more that again, because it's such a large impact, it totally made all of the initial numbers that I pulled irrelevant <laughs> because most of that work was in fact, not personal work, but forks from something else that eventually ended up getting merged back into the other project. Um, so again, like I was fighting with the system process and design uh, versus just being able to pull data and understand it. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know, I haven't really seen us address that nuance or I guess like be aware of, like there's always, like I mentioned it in talks when it's like automation could be doing stuff and messing up your metrics, but there's also just, again, the system design process and workflow that could be like in this case directly influencing the structure of the data and the metrics that you might pull from it. I want to clarify something. So there's a, I think there's a principle implicit in most of the metrics that we do, especially around commits and pull requests. That really the only things that ever get counted are the commits to the primary branch of whatever repository that you're tracking. 
So we won't necessarily see the forks unless we explicitly say that we want metrics on these fork repos, typically. So you basically just remove that funkiness from your data by only looking at the main branch. That's that's what most like that's what Grimoire Lab does. That's what Augur does. Mm -hmm. And if we want to monitor forks that we know are significant, those just get added as separate repos, and then we can see the action in there. But you're right, and and so we I don't Augur does not use the event stream except supplement for supplementary data to check when things close or open. And so if you're relying in largely on the event stream, then I, I can see where it would get wonky. So I guess it's good to know. I mean, like, I think that's, and I assume that was happening in these tools because I know that there is some manipulation and engineering happening to ensure that you're looking at the real data and not the noise around the data. Um, but I think depending on it, the tools that you're using that might, like you might have to do that as well or like have some correction in it to look at the accurate thing versus, or just like acknowledge what you're not looking at. I, I guess I'm describing this poorly, but I, I just like, I'm curious, I guess it makes sense that in our tooling we've, or the folks that are working on it have ensured accuracy by engineering the output versus the input versus those that are just looking at a raw field of data and having to deal with it on their own. But maybe we don't address yeah, this now. I, mean, I just kind of wanted to float it as a problem. Well, I, I think I think I would, I mean, personally, I'd like to understand in a little bit more depth what, what kinds of issues you're encountering to make sure that we're not missing something that's really important that people care about. Because when I, when I listen to you talk, I'm thinking, I mean, well, I think they're describing maybe the Maybe the box we drew around this is wrong. <laughs> Not necessarily. I think it's always the like the design parameters. What are you trying to solve? What are you trying to achieve? And I'm going into a giant data set with another question that was not part of the structure of what this thing was designed to answer. So that's sort of, again, on me, I'm trying to see if I can figure something else, else out by looking more comprehensively at the entire set of events and activities. But um yeah i don't know I, I guess it's one of those things where like if you were totally new to this sort of thing and you weren't aware about how about this about i guess the system structure maybe it just comes down to the fact that like i we, this comes back to our previous conversation maybe we need training on github workflows because understanding the workflow and processes better could maybe help to shed some light on where you could get caught up in this the system design itself if you're looking at data from github which is a little bit meta <laughs> but related back to like what what we do as chaos and extended data analysts around open source projects well i would say sophia if somebody like you got confused or unclear about it then there's a pretty good chance that anybody new to the community would get confused or unclear about it so it's, it's worth a conversation and figuring it out so we can at least explain it back to people I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was confused. I was just kind of like stuck in the mess <laughs> of like trying to remove the the system level structure on what I was actually looking at. So it's like I'm, I'm going through my own sort of filtering and normalization process to try to answer my own question. But I think yeah, maybe no, there's I, nuances I suspect, that I'm missing. I suspect you're not alone. actually did have a conversation with some of the Baturgia slash Grimoire folks and about this problem particularly. And I think they actually have been looking at it because for someone else had a similar question. Uh, so I'm curious how, how they, how they're approaching it as well. Um, again, hard, hard conversation. I, I know I just posed it. Maybe this is a good dawn question for the possible data scientists joining our team. Uh, but like, I don't know if there's a home for that in this project, but I just wanted to raise it as a, a thought. Because that, I mean, if I'm under, am I understanding right that the, the challenge with the data engineering that you're encountering is related to what you're able to pull from the event stream? In my particular case, but it's it's more that I think there we have the metrics and we have the software, and the software is removing a lot of that 
com system complexity to be able to arrive at the metrics. But I think what's not being explained is unless you're familiar with the software design, like our software design, uh, the broader projects under chaos and Grimoire Labs and Augur, then it, we're kind of abstracting away that complexity, which is great because that's what the tools are designed to do. But if you end up trying to do this on your own versus using the software, you have to either come into that aware of it or deal with it. <laughs> uh, and so I'm wondering, like, again, right now, how the project has been handling that is by abstracting it through software and removing the complexity through software versus trying to be more um, have more conversations or guidance around the sort of the data engineering process to arrive at those things. So maybe that is, I don't know, maybe we don't do that because that is being solved with software versus having that more as a sort of open discussion and of, of data engineering as a process. I think um, um, I'm going to send you a message to ask if we can chat about this in a just so I can get a better understanding of what it is that's going on. So okay. I, I do think this is a, an area that we should explore further. So I, in the past, I've tried to uh, do some research around uh, uh, pull request success, merge success in relation to forks. Uh, so the to the point that you've been making, Sophia, a lot of the work that's being done on these projects are being done out away from the, the main branch, right? It's being done on these these individual repos. Uh, so it's and those those these individual repos or forks are they're basically a black box, right? So once they fork them, we're not including any of the metrics around the work that's being done in those repos. We don't know there could be 10 people working in there. There could be one person working in there. There could be two people working in there. Uh, the only thing we care about when it comes back to that main branch is the is basically the one commit and or the the one pull request and the merge success. Uh, so there's there's a lot that we don't understand about the work being done in a project uh, in most projects because it, it's occurring outside of the project, right? I, I, if I understand that correctly, and that's and that's something I noticed as well. So the 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 complexity of figuring out what was happening in those forks was not something I was able to overcome in this project. So I had to kind of transition it into a, a, a different thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> I also feel like I, I'm looking at it from another nuance, but where we do have visibility in that, because I'm looking at it from the lens of our employees and the lens of our contributors versus the lens of the repositories or projects. Um, in that case, that work is visible to me, but I'm trying to bucket it. <laughs> so it, it's more like, trying to count it because that is work happening, even though it's not visible in the activity around the main branch. Um, and so we're able to include that work, but I'm also trying to include it relatively such that it doesn't look like net new stuff. It's actually existing stuff. It's just also counted as part of that work. So it's a bit of a, a balance. Like I'm trying to understand how to, how to do, again, like how to bucket work type basically, but also I, I see it from a different lens, so I can see that extended work inside of our contributing population versus like I'm not seeing outside of that because we're not tracking anyone else but our own employees. Um, so I'm coming at it from a different angle, but I think we're kind of talking about the same problem and I think it is it is challenging and maybe something that I would hope we could provide more guidance on to others that might be doing this. So again, this sounds like actually a Dawn problem. Now, I feel like this always happens when she's not at meetings. I just create ideas for her and work for her that she has no idea about. And it's okay if she doesn't pick it up, but like, it's an idea. <laughs> totally agree. Um, and I'm so sorry to cut this conversation short, but we are four minutes over. So I just wanted to give time for everybody to get to their next meeting. So thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for great conversations today. And when Dawn comes back, we will inundate her with all of the new work that she now has to worry about. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.